in watts. You with me so far? So it's everybody's agreed on definition of power. Okay. So now let's see if you had a resistor. Okay. Resistor. You had a voltage, you had a current. So what would the power of this guy look like? Well, let's say you V is equal to IR. So it'd have the instantaneous voltage and instant, instead of the instantaneous current, I would do this transformation so I'd have the V sub T over R. So it's a V squared as a function of T over R. Okay, so that's the power across a resistor, right? You guys, this, that looks familiar, hopefully, right? V squared over R. But it comes from this P is equal to IV. I just did the transformation, put the I in terms of V. I could have easily done the other way, which was put V is equal to IR, so power of T is I of T times I of T R. So it's I squared of T R. You with me? Okay, so it's just the definition of power. Now, if we had some, some by, by the way, this is like sort of a, a slight tangent, and I'm gonna come back to, to CMOS logic, okay? So if I have a capacitor, what do I do? Well, it's a little funky here, because um, there's, you know, what is current into a capacitor? There's like charge into a capacitor, there's a voltage across the capacitor, but no current really flows across a capacitor, right? There's no current flows across the dielectric, okay? But indeed what happens is the equation for a capacitor is Q is equal to CV, sort of the fundamental capacitor. So if I, so if I have something that changes as a function of time, if I have take the derivative at a function of time on both sides. dQ dt by definition is current, change in charge with respect to current, so this is I of t is equal to C dV dt. So what would it look like? Let's say I had, oops, if I had a current source going across a capacitor and I had a current, what would this voltage look like as a function of time? Well, what would happen is you would just get a, this is a function of time, but this is in terms of the voltage and charge, right? So if, I'm, if I've got a current going on this capacitor, this capacitor, the voltage across it would just go up, if it was discharged at the beginning, right? It would just get charged up and the voltage across it would be the amount of charge that's, that's dumped there, like a cumulative charge now we're talking about, right? So if the current is constant, if this current is constant, so let me first start with this. Let's say this is I, so it's constant current. So I'm just not, not changing as a function of time, it's always one micron into a microfarad capacitor, right? Your cumulative jumping, dumping charge into that capacitor, and the voltage would just keep going up across that capacitor. Keep going up to it. It reaches to infinite voltages. And of course, it does not happen because your current source, the real current source, has a power supply. After a certain time, it just just can't surprise any supply any more current. Okay, you with me? So in practice, what typically happens is you have a current source that's usually hooked up to some supply that's going to some capacitor. And as a function of time, what happens is the current goes up and at some point that current source stops being able to work. So if this current source was a PMOS transistor, 
it, this would go up to VDD and then this gets stuck there. Because not, I mean, if you, if you gave the capacitor more charge, it, it's, its voltage would increase across it. But as a math, matter of fact, at some voltage, the current source is going to stop working. You guys with me? OK. So OK. So it's easier, or the only way, to look at power to charge and discharge a capacitor, right? Because there's no actual current flowing across the capacitor. You think about the, because current goes for a while and then stops. You see what I'm saying? So instantaneous current is not helping you with power on a capacitor. You guys see what I'm, where I'm going with this? Because you want to know, it just doesn't help you, OK? Because there's no such th in, there's instantaneous current for a while, and then it changes, right? It goes to zero current over here, right? So it's easier to think of. Go ahead, sorry. Um, I was just going to say, is that why there's more resistors on a chip? Or not resistors, sorry, capacitors on the chips than like, uh, other components that no, no, you're, I, but I like where your head's at, but that's not the case. You're talking about on a board or something like that? Yeah. So what the real reason for that is that um, it comes from the, so, so this you'll see all the time, right? You'll see a board, a printed circuit, circuit board. It's this big, your chip's sitting here. You've got a couple of resistors here and there. And then you've got an ocean like of capacitors everywhere. Everywhere. Every blank space has a capacitor. OK? The reason for that is that um, I think I might have mentioned in the previous class was that is you're using these to decouple or to clean your power supplies. OK? So the reason is that, let's say your connector is here. Did you guys remember that, or should I mention it again? I'll be happy to. OK, I'll, I'll be happy to. It's bringing it back. Yeah, but it's, I'm happy to mention it, because this is like, there's a science to these capacitors and power supply. And like, uh, have you guys heard of the 80-20 rule? So this is like rule holds for everything, apparently. It's never quite 80-20 necessarily. It may be 90-10 or 70-30. What it says is everything in life is 80-20. For example, 20% of your customers create 80% of your headaches. OK? It's 80-20. Apparently, it like holds in everything. I can, think, I can vouch for it. 20% of your customers bring you 80% of your profits. Cross the line. 20% of your products bring you 80% of your profits. OK? So where's I going with that? Oh, yeah. So trouble is also the same way in engineering. So the 80-20 rule is like 20% of your system gives you 80% of the headaches. And power supply decoupling gives you 80% of the headaches on your print and circuit board design. Because it's really hard to get right, even after everything said and done. But anyway, the idea is that if you have a connector, right? this, this is what gets connected as a power supply. OK, it's going to have to get connected to this chip. OK, this chip, because it's a CMOS chip, almost all these chips are CMOS chips, right? They have a pull-up network. Every one of these 20 billion gates or transistors, whatever, has a pull-up network and a pull-down network. And they're switching, right? So they're pulling current from the supply next Next picosecond, they're dumping the current into the ground, and the guy next door is pulling current. So the current coming from, from this is really, really all over the place. It's very variable. Okay, And because this line here is inductive, no matter what you do to it, it'll be inductive. It'll just be some amount of inductance. The voltage across an inductor is L, D, I, D, T. Okay? Now, you're going to work like hell to make this L small, OK? But there'll be some L there. And this DI, this change in current as a function of time, 
in a, your AMD chip, in your Intel chip, in your Xilinx FBA are some gigantic number because all these transistors are constantly pulling and dumping current, pulling current, letting go, dump current, whatever. And so if you did not do anything, the voltage, so this would be your supply voltage at your chip at here, with this being the inductance, and this being the current on your supply that's varying, this would be all over the place, okay? It, it would break. You cannot use this chip just doing it this way, okay? What would happen is, as a function of time, this voltage here, your VDD that you would like to be solid is going to do this because of this LDIDT. Okay, so what's your solution? Well, what you can do is put res charge reservoirs here and as many as you can, okay? And these guys momentarily, as you get pull current very quickly, they momentarily supply charge to smooth out these ups and downs. Okay, see what I'm saying? So you either have an inductor there and you're pulling charge in and out of that and creating this voltage, or you've got a local reservoir that's pulling, ch pulling charge. It, you'll, you'll still eventually have to pull in current from the supply to recharge your reservoir back. But just for that instant second when you've got a real fast pull, it's supplying it, keeping your supply clean and letting you like, have a smooth transition. Now, the reason why it's such a difficult task is you've got lots of different power supplies on your chip, not just one, different pins got all these different inductances. And imagine like what kind of mess you're gonna have on your current, like and what value capacitor you put in there. Capacitors themselves have inductance built into these packages. The big capacitors have a lot of inductance. The smaller capacitors have smaller inductance. They tend to resonate because you have essentially R, L, C, just as the capacitor itself at different frequencies as we'll see. So that's why you, you splatter a bunch in different places, and a lot of it is guesswork. But anyway, that was a long story about capacitors. But it's not because of what we were talking about right now. Okay. Okay. So, so this is the capacitor. We can't talk about power in terms of because because this current changes, right? So what we talk about is in terms of the total energy that's required to to charge this thing up. So I always have to look at, look at these derivations. So energy is integral of power. OK? So this is what we need. That's why, because of the, the instantaneous power changes as we're charging this capacitor, or discharging it, we're going to basically look at the power as it changes. You with me? So if I want to see the, the energy that it took to charge this guy up, I would integrate this from zero to infinite time. OK? And this would tell me the energy. And each, so at here, there's no current flowing, right? You guys with me? Because the current stopped flowing here. So there is no power. There's zero power here. Okay, here there is power, so there is energy being used here. So I'm going to integrate this from zero to infinity, but you only need to do the integral from here to here to get the total energy it took to charge this capacitor up to a value. Okay, do you guys see where I'm going with this? So I'm, 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 I couldn't do power because this, this capa it's a capacitor dumping charge into it for a while. After a while, there's no more current flow. So, so I'm stuck with doing energy, and I'm checking to see how, long, how much energy does it take to, uh, to charge it up to a certain voltage. OK? So how does that look? So what I can do, this is this P of t is, oops, is from 0 to infinity, i of t dt, sorry, sorry, it, vt, dt, okay, and then 
this is 0 to infinity, so i of t is c dv dt, right? Remember, this comes from q is equal to cv, sorry, and taking the derivative of both sides. You guys with me? Okay, so I'm going to plug that in and get c dv dt uh, v of t dt. So this allows me to do this. This allows me to, don't ask for me to justify this. Uh, my calculus is not good enough. My ability to get rid of this and change my, to, in, to change this from integrating across time to v of t dt from 0 to v dt. I saw that sleight of hand. Did you like it? OK. So what does this look like? C V T squared over 2, 0 to V D D. C V D D squared over 2 minus 0. Okay. You guys with me? So that, that's the energy it took to do this function, to do this activity, to charge up this capacitor. So remember, this is, this is time now. The reason it stopped charging up is because we were in a real system, and at some point we hit the power supply, and things stopped. Good? Okay. So that's the energy it took to charge that up to that value. Okay? So now let's look at a situation where you have a digital circuit, right? A digital circuit does goes up and down, up and down, up and down with time. Let me just do this. So, sorry, guys. Good. So... I have this PMOS, NMOS. So this is the capacitor I'm going to charge and discharge. OK? Now, what happens if I have it? Let's say you had a digital circuit. It's time, it's voltage. And so V out was kind of doing this. I'm not going to draw it accurately, but. Like at a pulse strain. So let's say it was a clock, clock circuit. You guys remember the 80 20 rule? Okay. So another 80 20 rule is about like pretty much like 20% of your chip power comes from your clock network. A huge amount of your chip power comes from your clocking. 20% is huge. So let's say if you have a 40-watt chip. Who had a 40-watt chip? Somebody had a 40-watt chip, right? Remember this, anybody? But like 10 watts of that is just your clock, which is amazing, right? And we'll see why that's the case. So let's say this is the clock, and it's doing that, right? So what, what does it say? So every one of these cycles, you're putting in a bunch of energy here to charge this capacitor up, OK? And I'm spending a bunch of energy to discharge the capacitor, right? So if I have, say, forever and ever, 
I would have only three of these cycles of, of charge and discharge, charge and discharge, charge and discharge. Okay, let's say just did three cycles and then it would be quiet for all of time, right? I would integrate each one of these guys from zero to infinity in time. So let's say I look at each one of these guys as its own separate cycle, okay? So if I just saw this as this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy, whoops. I would see each of them as an energy delivery or energy removal event. You guys with me? Energy delivery, energy removal. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Is it only at the uh, transitions uh, that it uses energy, or is it the whole area under it? That's a very good question. So there's, because, it, bear with me, and I'll, I'll give you an answer in a second. But you're saying as a capacitor or a CMOS circuit? Uh, just a capacitor. So is if you dump current and charge a capacitor, wouldn't you use energy if you discharge the capacitor too? Is it different? You wouldn't use any energy to discharge the capacitor? It's charged. You're getting a change in energy is coming because you're changing the voltage. You, you buy the energy change because you're changing the voltage? So I'm either changing the voltage in a positive way or a negative way. So I'm either putting energy, I guess the other way to look at it is you're either putting energy into the capacitor or taking energy away from the capacitor. Is that what you mean? So that, that you can think of it that way. So that the capacitor is storing energy. Does that, does that make sense? So either you're putting energy into the capacitor or removing energy, but it's an energy, energy is changing across the capacitor, okay? Is that maybe, maybe I should have said it like that, okay? So you guys, you guys with me? Okay. So now let's look at what happens, right? Because in a CMOS circuit, we're interested, the power is the power coming from the supply. Okay? That's where the power that will that's we have to deliver to this to the circuit. Okay? So in this rising transition, this guy's on, this guy's off. Right? So this guy is charging this capacitor. And so the power supply is delivering one half CV, and just didn't think of it as this guy, CVDD squared of energy to this capacitor. Sorry, 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 sorry. So the, what's going on is, what am I doing here? Did I do this right? Ah, okay. So maybe I did this wrong here. So to think of this as being that this this actually means your if if v of is a function of v of t, this still is the voltage across the capacitor. Okay, so this will be voltage across capacitor squared, right? Because it's changing with time. Okay, if you had a situation where you had um, I at T, V of T from zero to VDD, DT, 
right? You would have, uh, so this would be the energy. You would be, let's say V of T. If, so, okay, sorry. So I mean, I'm con convoluting two things. So we calculated the energy going into the capacitor, okay? It was this one half CV squared, okay? Now let's look at the energy coming out of the supply, okay? So what is the supply doing? The supply, in a supply, the V of T is constant. It's always VDD, okay? I'm doing the same thing as the capacitor, except I'm just making this constant, VDD constant, because the voltage across the supply is not changing. Does that make sense? So it's the same equation, same everything. This is the energy of the supply. You guys buying it? No? So in this case, I can take this guy over here bring it out of the integral. Okay, so again, I get this, this guy, so it's VDD. Sorry guys, I gotta put in a missing a C here. So it ends up being C V D D times V from zero to V D D. Okay, C V D D squared. So in the case of the previous, uh, when I was just looking at the capacitor, it was um, one half C V squared because the voltage on the capacitor was changing as I was charging it up. So current was going into the capacitor, but it's only one half CV squared. The same current, the same current coming out of the supply to charge that capacitor gives you an energy of CV VD squared coming out of the supply because the voltage on the supply is constant. Does that make sense? It's a little weird. So let me draw it again. Let me draw it another way. So this is you got the PMOS. So here, when I do the energy into the capacitor, is one I got, I got one half C V squared. Okay, with V V being V D D squared and this and this side. Right, if I look at the energy being delivered here, right? The energy being pulled from the supply ended up being C V D D squared. Because this is always constant at V D D. It's not charging up. This point with time it's doing that. This point in time is doing that. Does that make sense? Does that make your head hurt? Do you guys see what, what, what I did mathematically? Like visually it makes sense, right? This is, if I'm getting the area for the same amount of time, these two areas are not gonna be the same, right? In fact, if I just stop here, this looks like kind of half the area of that guy, right? So, so I'm pulling in to charge that capacitor. I'm pulling C V D D squared from the supply. And I'm dumping one half V D D squared into the capacitor. So where's the other power going? Where's the other energy going? Any ideas? It gets basically there's a resistance here. 
well, this, this P MOSFET has a resistance. It's a switch, it has a resistance, and basically what's happening is that difference, that one half sort of CV squared gets, turns to heat in the P MOS. Okay? So basically, could end up with one half end up with C V D D squared minus one half C V D D squared worth worth of thermal thermal energy coming out of that guy. It's heating up my circuit. Everybody believe what I'm telling you? Believe me. Although I did a poor job of explaining it. Okay, so what happens in the pull-down cycle? Remember, this is a clock. So we're charging the capacitor up, and then we're going to discharge the capacitor. What happens on a discharge of the capacitor? The NMOS turns on, the PMOS turns off, and then this guy discharges this, this guy. Okay. So now, you remove the energy, that one-half CV D squared energy, away from the, out of the capacitor, you discharge it, and now you dump it into the ground, okay? So this first part was the rising edge. This part I'm talking about is the falling edge, okay? When the NMOS turns on, it's the falling edge, because this one guy is getting drained to ground. You guys with me? Yeah? So in this case, you're removing this energy through the NMOS, and what happens is you basically, the NMOS sucks up this energy in the form of that one-half VDD squared instead of thermal energy. Okay? Okay. So this was what happened in one cycle of my clock. Okay? Now, over this cycle of the clock, over this period of T, so th let's say this, this period from here to here is the clock period T. Okay? So 1 over T is the frequency that you guys are, like if you're looking at a 2 gigahertz chip, okay, it basically means your clock period is 0.5 nanoseconds. Okay, so like say if you had a gigahertz is one times 10 to the ninth. Okay, so, so this is in, in hertz, it's one over seconds. So the p clock period for that gigahertz would be one times 10 to the minus nine seconds. That would be one period of your clock. Okay? So what I can say is so where, where we started was instantaneous power, which is P of T dt. Sorry, P of T is V of T dt. This is the inst instantaneous power, okay? But because we have this capacitive situation where we don't really have instantaneous power, we have energy, we talk about average power, okay? So we calculated the energy which was instantaneous power over this period, right? So to go back to power, so this is average, is we take this energy and we divide it by the period. It looks like I'm going back and forth, back and forth, but notice something. This is instantaneous power. This is average power. Does this make sense? It's really hard in your in the chip, like I was saying, in the, in a in your in your microprocessors, it's really hard to measure, practically impossible to measure instantaneous power. It also doesn't really make sense, right? If I have my cell phone and it's operating, like take it's taking taking video, right? Which takes sucks up a lot of power. Okay? You want to know over that the time of that three-minute video, how much power the chip burned. 
Okay, but each each picosecond, it's really hard to tell. Does that make sense? So I just divide this energy, the total energy expenditure, by the average time. So it looks like I'm just going back and forth, but this is average power. This is instantaneous power. Okay. So in a, for example, in the case of a capacitor, right? The instant, there's no in, there's no instantaneous power here. You guys all agree with me at this point? Because there's no current flowing here. There's zero power here. There's zero power here. There's a bunch of energy charging the capacitor here. So there's power here. So I would sort of get the average power across this whole period and call that my average power. Does that make sense why I'm going to average power? Because so, I have a capacitive system and I'm, I can't, doesn't make sense to talk about. If I, if I tell you about the instantaneous power in the cycle, it'll go between high power to zero, something, zero, that kind of thing. Yeah, doesn't make sense. Okay, so if you look at this thing, what happens? During this one cycle, T, if you look at just the power supply, what, did the, what was the power out of the power supply? Okay, the power supply spent CVDD squared to charge the capacitor here. Okay, that was the energy coming out of the power supply. You guys with me? Okay. Now, the rest of this time, stuff happened, right? But here there was no current. Here there was energy leaving the capacitor and going into the ground, etc. But the power supply was disconnected from my capacitor. So in fact, during this whole cycle, the on only energy that came out of my power supply was this CVDD squared. That, and it only happened during this rising edge. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so I was just using giving you guys the case of an inverter, but in fact the rest of the CMOS gates work the same way. You got a network of PMOS transistors and a network of NMOS transistors. It doesn't matter how many are connected to what, because notice in the end the power coming out of the supply was not a function of the resistance of this guy. It was just a function of the capacitance that it was driving and the power supply, okay? The resistance of this guy kind of says, oh, this is a, a, so much power gets burned in that PMOS or whatever, but the actual power coming out of the supply, this is kind of an interesting thing here, is only a function of the capacitance you're driving because it sort of like self shuts off, right? It dumps this current into here and as soon as you get, as soon as this guy this, the larger this is, the more charge it'll suck in, the more current it'll suck in, and the higher the supply is, the higher, the longer you're, you're dumping current into that capacitor, so those are the only two things that matter. And they only matter as far as the supply is concerned, again, is during this rising edge. The rest of the time, you know, energy is changing hands back and forth, but the supply doesn't see it, it's, it's cut off from that. Okay, so again, if you had a, like a NAND, like let's say if you had a NOR gate. Driving some kind of a capacitor, it's the same deal. The, these two guys would have to be both on for the supply to see the capacitor and charge it up to some value. And still the supply would do CVDD squared as the energy would have to make this guy rise once. And this is the C, this is VDD. Okay? So basically, any CMOS circuit, okay, that's the energy, that's the power on a pulse. So every time you, only during the rising edge of transitions do you burn power. The supply sees power only the rising edge of transition. So if I had 
this kind of situation. Okay? Only, I would only see this guy. Would only use power from the supply over here. Okay. So, and in a inverse case, let's say we go back to the clock. Okay, how would we look at the power consumption on this clock? What would be that? What would be the average power consumption in one clock period? Any ideas? Who will volunteer? Who will be volunteer or be voluntold to help me? Because I notice people are getting, getting sleepy. I need to. Is volunteering. I think I'm going to pick on Yaakov. <laughs> Sorry, Yaakov. Couldn't be helped. It's that king shirt. No, it's a king shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So you so said the power consumed by the clock? Yeah, so if, let's say I have the circuit. It's doing this, right? This looks like a clock. Are you guys remember a clock? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, you're synchronizing your circuit, so every clock period, it's T, you get a pulse, and that's your clock, right? So if I have this case, what's the average power of the circuit over one clock period? So let's start with this way. Mm -hmm. When would you get power from this? When, when is the uh, supply? On the rising edge. Just during the rising edge. Yeah. So over this period, this is the only place you have to worry about. There's no power coming from the supply here, here, here. Right? Here, because the, current, the supply is connected to the capacitor, but there's zero current. You've already charged up the capacitor. Here, the supply is disconnected from the capacitor because the PMOS is off and you're pulling it down. Same here. So the only time you're connected to the capacitor and you've got a current coming from your supply is there. So that's one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in that transition, how much power consumption does your, how much power is your supply delivering to this capacitor? So it was C V D D squared. That's correct. Yeah. So here. You, you divide by T. Remember, F is 1 over T. Okay. This is amazing or what? So, what does this tell me? This tells me that I can make the transistors, it doesn't matter what's, I can make these wide, I can make them narrow. I can make this transition happen quickly. I can make it happen slow. Doesn't matter. It just, my power consumption, my average power consumption of a CMOS circuit is dependent on the clock frequency. And that's because it's how many transitions I get, essentially, on a clock, okay? Depends on my supply squared. That means this is why people want to drive their supplies very low, as low as they can. Because if your supply is one, or if it's two volt, if it's two volt supply, it doesn't burn twice as much power as four times as much power consumption as a one volt supply. Okay? And capacitance 
is all the capacitances in your circuit. So imagine every single chip, uh, every single sorry, uh, circuit that's switching, all the gates it's driving, all the interconnection between them, those all sum up to the total load capacitance that, that goes into this thing, to this calculation. But to first order, if I think about this guy, it doesn't matter how big this guy is, this amount of goes into this equation directly. It does go into this equation another way because remember, somebody else is driving here. So this is, if I make this too big, that's an extra capacitive load I don't need that somebody else has to drive. Because I, I worry about the total capacitance on, of all the circuits that are charging, discharging, okay? So capacitance, bad, but not that bad, not bad as supply voltage. And so then there's a frequency component, okay? So now that's, that's you could make that, that trans, Translation of this T and F because it's a clock, because I told you you get transition every clock. Most circuits, what this is, and this saves you on a CMOS chip, most circuits aren't transitioning every clock period. They're doing something, stopping, whatever, right? So in fact, let's think of a, let's think of it, so this is clock. Once we get to the synchronous circuits, you'll see that, so this is clock, sorry. Data, if you look at synchronous data, can only transition on one edge of the clock, right? So the fastest any data could transition in your synchronous circuit is on these, let's say it's on the rising edge of the clock, it can transition there. It can transition there. So let's say it's this data is going nuts and transitioning as fast as it can. The fastest any synchronous data can transition is at half your clock rate. Does that make sense? So if I'm getting one, two, three transitions here, well, I don't need to draw a fourth one to show you guys. So, so the data by nature, if, as long as data is transitioning at half the clock amount. You do with me, Arthur? And so, and then random data isn't doing that. It's just transitioning every like it just goes up, waits there for a while, goes down, you name it. I don't know what random data happens. So what people do, so you have this CV squared F, right, as your, as your power consumption. For your average, for your circuit, they also throw in a fudge factor alpha. What's that? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a transition frequency. So this alpha, so alpha is equal to one for a clock circuit. It's equal to 0.5 for high-speed data. And it's equal to 0.1 for random data. You pick, it's not a science, right? We're saying, oh, like, yeah, on the average, these circuits, like as a designer, I know most of the circuit is sitting there quiet, it's not transitioning. So maybe in, in that circuit, you decide your alpha is 0 0.001, because it's really like not doing this sleep most of the time. But certainly the clock, you know, the alpha is one, the CV squared up. You guys with me? How do you think about this? So you're doing, we're doing an estimation on power consumption, right? So if you look at a circuit, okay, this is going back to your presentation, trying to figure out your power consumption, right? You're, this is why the clock, by the way, takes 20% of the power consumption, because it's, it's constantly chugging along, okay? And it's driving, that clock is driving every, by, almost by definition, driving every frickin' flip-flop in your, in your chip. That means the capacitance is gonna be huge, okay? So C is huge on a clock, and F is huge on a clock. So power consumption is huge, okay? Some 
circuit you've got in the corner of your chip. It's a serial interface that you're loading registers on your chip that, that's running at five megahertz, running once every 10 minutes, loading up and then being quiet. That alpha is like nothing. It might be point oh, 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 whatever. You don't need to a lot of you worry about it. And so on and so forth. Okay? So this is kind of what you do if, if, if you guys, so going back to your presentation or estimates, I was, you don't have, I'll, I'll, the, the slides has a, a, some examples of how you would use this. I'll, I'll, I'll send you which slide deck to look at, the presentation and stuff. Like if you have a memory, you'd go, okay, this is the capacitance, average values, et cetera. If you have a clock, you have certain values, whatever. But you could look at your circuit and you go, you know what? I'm gonna make a lower power consumption chip than the competition. Or uh, let's actually, let's, let's start easier, right? Let's say, you say, look what, um, this chip, I'm gonna, my competition is I can't compete with this previous chip on, on, um, on uh, price, I'm gonna compete in performance. Somebody mentioned that, right? I'm gonna compete in performance by making a faster chip, okay? Well, you made it faster, okay, congratulations, but now your power consumption went up. How are you gonna, how are you gonna induce your customer to buy something that's higher power consumption is gonna go, what, what, what are you gonna give them, okay? If maybe you're saying, oh, I, I get higher performance, but okay, like justified because you, you, your power consumption went up. Now, if simultaneously you went from an older process that had a 1.8 volt supply or 1.2 volt supply to a one volt supply thing, you shrank your supply, well, great, you get some of that back. But that's not so easy to do in most of the, most of the chips you guys picked because even if you're going from a 45 nanometer process, that supply voltages are volts. They're going to 28 nanometers, you're still around the volts. So you're not, the, the problem is supply voltages have stopped. So, you're, you know, we gotta be thinking about power consumption. I gave the suggestion to you guys, I think, to combine two chips, right? Now I've combined two chips. Now, you got more capacitances, right? Because you got all, both of them put in together. So that combined chip takes up more power, but each individual chip would have taken a certain amount of power, plus you've got the connectivity between the two, which is high capacitance lines on your printed circuit board. So in the, you do benefit, you actually get a reduction in power supply, power consumption if you combine them. That's why people integrate. It's good. You reduce your power consumption um, a little bit, at least you don't bring it up, and you reduce your cost. Performance may be about the same. Okay? So the other thing you could do is look at your chip and you go, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not have some type of high speed block in here, so I'm gonna take my power consumption reduce my power consumption, okay? So this is your next, this is getting more difficult to try to guess what to do with your presentation chips in terms of the modification. But the nice thing is that you have, a, there's a really simple equation in power, in power consumption. And to estimate it, you just use this alpha factor capacitive voltage, whatever, right? So you can kind of look at your chip and go, okay, is it gonna be the change I'm making? Is it neutral in power consumption? Is it increasing power support consumption? Is it reducing power consumption? Depending on what you decided to do. We just, I just used some examples, right? If you went in a drastically reduced power supply, you could reduce the power consumption. You increase the clock frequency, your power consumption goes up and so on and so forth. So like Brianna, have you tell us talk about, you, you guys were doing AMD? Intel. Oh, Intel. Did you, in terms of what were you guys gonna do? We talked about price, right? So I talked about the chip. Where are you guys gonna 
change anything? Or how are we going to compete on? Have you thought about what, what competition would be? Okay. So let's say you look at it and you go, yeah, I'm going to fight with these guys on price. Then I'm going to give you guys a hard time because everybody's going to get a hard time one way or another. Uh, is like, how are you going to compete with Intel? Like, how are you going to do better on price? And are you going to shrink your chip or are you going to do whatever? No. So that kind of might be hard for you guys, right? So then what are you going to do? Are you going to get a high performance chip? What are you going to do on the power consumption? How much higher performance? What do you think that'll do to the power consumption? See where this is going? Yeah. So the next sort of step on your presentation is thinking about power, power consumption. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.